Please be seated. Why hasn't the world come to an end yet? Why hasn't Jesus come back yet? This is one of the earliest questions in the Christian scriptures. Christianity, as a general matter, is an apocalyptic religion. That is, there is an end of the world. Cosmic history, it has a shape, and it's a shape a bit like the shape of a human life. A human life, we are born and we live and we die. You and I have just this one life to lead. Cosmic history is the same in its basic shape. It begins at creation. Then there is all of time, that's where we are, and then there is a final ending. And at that final ending, the resurrected Christ is returning to the world. Christ's return, it will usher in a new realm, a new heaven and a new earth where sorrow and sighing will be no more. When death and pain are past, when the world's problems are simply over. That all sounds pretty great, all the world's troubles going away to be replaced with plenty and grace and peace and health and life. Yes, please. However, and this is a big however, the however is when. When is this new world going to get here? When is sorrowing and sighing going to pass away? When is Jesus going to come back? Because it seems like it's been a while. The idea of the end of the world, it is, it is captivating. Now, don't take my word for it. In my 42 years of life, there have been kind of a lot of predictions of the apocalypse. The rollover of the millennia, it not only spurred technological concerns, but there was also widespread belief that Jesus was going to return to the earth. People in general also just seem to love calendar rollovers because in 2012, there was again widespread interest in the Mayan calendar, which was set to have all of its digits roll over back to zero, like a mechanical odometer hitting a million miles. And this sparked much interest in the idea of the end of the world. We had a would-be apocalypse last week with a, frankly, pretty underwhelming earthquake and a pretty awesome eclipse, sparking ideas that the apocalypse surely must be just around the corner. We throw around the word apocalypse willy-nilly. People are talking about the cicada apocalypse. <laughs> and they're just, that's a little much, okay? Because they're just bugs. They are admittedly loud bugs, but they are just bugs. The idea that the world, that it might be transformed, that it might suddenly be different, this idea of an apocalypse, it captivates the imagination. And this is not new, not in the slightest. Today's reading is from the book of 1 Thessalonians, which was written in roughly the year 50 or 51, and it is concerned with the apocalypse. Now, this book, 1 Thessalonians, is undisputedly the earliest book in the New Testament, predating the earliest Gospels by a couple of decades. And in this book, the main question being wrestled with is, how come Jesus hasn't come back? How come the world hasn't ended? So for a bit of context, 1 Thessalonians, it was written by the Apostle Paul and was written very close to the time of Jesus' life, maybe 16 or 17 years after Jesus' life. For reference, 16 years ago, Barack Obama was elected president. It's just 16 years just isn't a particularly long time. First Thessalonians was written pretty soon after Jesus' life, and even with just a span of a decade and a half, even in that short time, the earliest Christians were concerned, how come Jesus hasn't come back yet? How come this promised realm of peace hadn't arrived yet? Where is this end of the world? And they were concerned because members of the church, members of the faithful, 
they, they were beginning to die of illness, of old age, of accident. They were beginning to die. And people were beginning to get worried that maybe they weren't going to see it. The earliest Christians, they had thought that being a Christian was, a, it was, it was going to be a sprint to just bear down and hold out until the, the trumpet crash, until tearing through the ribbon like a tearing of the heavens, like a tearing of the curtain of the temple, that a new world would be theirs any day now. The Christians had been pinning all their hopes on Christ returning to the world soon and delivering them from all their troubles. They thought it was a sprint. It was not. So how could they endure then? They didn't know when the world was going to change. If it's something they might not even see with their own eyes, how are they supposed to live? They're not just holding out for everything to go pop. What are they supposed to do? How to live their lives if the end of the world wasn't just around the corner? Some of the believers had died. So they ask Paul, what are we to do? Paul says, so we die. We can yet endure. We shall keep on rising from the dead. We shall keep on rising from the dead. And while we yet live, we won't just sit around waiting, disconnected from the world. We will live good lives, endure and even thrive, and keep on rising from the dead. That is what Paul's admonitions and charge are all about. These beautiful words that we've read, be at peace among yourselves. Caution the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. These aren't just general words of advice. These are Paul's charge for how to live in a world when you must endure. Holding on to hope for an endured world, holding on to the promise of Christ's return, and living good lives all the while. And in holding on to that, to keep on rising from the dead. The earliest Christians had thought that the life of faith was, was a sprint. It wasn't. It isn't. If the church in Thessalonica thought 16 years was going to be a long time to wait for Jesus' return. I got some news for them. <laughs> the life of faith is not a sprint. It is much more like a marathon. It is not a test of speed, but of endurance. Endurance for generation after generation. And the only way to endure for this kind of race, in fact, is to keep on rising from the dead. To keep on rising from the dead is the only way to run this kind of race. It sounds impossible, I know, or at least fanciful. But I'm not being fanciful. Not in the slightest when I say that we must keep on rising from the dead. We in this room know a little something about this, about what it takes to keep on rising from the dead. I was a minister here in 2013. I served here when killers tried to take something good and peaceful and turn it into a site of terror forever. And perhaps for a time, they held the field for a day or two, three days at the most, because the power of death it cannot defeat those who keep on rising from the dead. What power does death have over those who keep on rising from the dead? 
the Boston Marathon was a beloved event before 2013. But since then, since then it has taken on a greater importance, an importance that can only be understood as spiritual. A spiritual importance of what it looks like to triumph over the powers of death. It looks like rising from the dead, to keep on rising. And you know what it looks like to keep on rising from the dead. Paul told us in the year 51 AD, it looks like encouraging the faint, helping the weak, seeking to do good to one another, repaying no one evil for evil. I don't know what the future is going to bring. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. I don't know what the future will bring. I don't know if in this cosmic sweep of history, if we are close to the end or we're still slogging through the first few miles. I don't know what the future will bring. But I know what we must do. What we must always do. And what is there for us? We must keep on rising from the dead. We keep on rising from the dead with the help of God. Amen.